Welcome to SVG TV News for Monday, March 1st, 2021. I am Rochelle Batiste with the details. 40,000 doses of the Covashield AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine arrived in the state today from India. Receiving the vaccines at the Argyle International Airport were Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Sinclair Jimmy Prince, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simone Kiza Beach, Permanent Secretary Cuthbert Knight, and representatives from the Indian High Commission and the Indian Heritage Foundation. At the handing over ceremony, representative of the Indian High Commission, Dr. Arnold Thomas, said that the vaccines from the government of India speaks volumes, noting that they will help in the fight against COVID-19 here in SVG and other Caribbean countries which stand to receive a similar donation. India remains committed to use its high-tech biopharma infrastructure to serve and protect humanity. India hopes that this genre of friendship will help government, help the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in their fight to contain and eradicate this corona pandemic and further deepen bilateral relations between the two friendly countries. Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Sinclair Jimmy Prince, thanked the government of India for the kind gesture and said that it will go a long way in rolling out the massive vaccination campaign across SVG. 40,000 is consistent in this particular policy and this strategy. Vaccination is an important intervention in the fight and we are going to ensure that we get as many vaccines into as many arms of the Vincentian population. I've been visiting some, some clinics and I see that the nurses, the other health workers are willing and ready to roll and we intend to start our program, to ramp up our program immediately. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is hopeful that more than one-fifth of the population will be vaccinated now that more of the Covashield AstraZeneca vaccine have arrived in the state. SVG has been using the Covashield AstraZeneca vaccine to roll out its vaccination program, starting with the 5,000 doses which arrived in the state a few weeks ago as a donation from Dominica. Today, PM Gonzalez said the 40,000 doses of the Covashield AstraZeneca vaccine from India will further boost the national vaccination campaign, which will hopefully bring back some level of normalcy in St. Vincent and the Grenadines once there is population immunity. Persons in this country below the age of 18, which means we are talking about 80,000 persons who are available. So a number somewhere around 70,000, 70,000 plus would be a good number for us to, to get, for, for us to get us close to a perfect scenario as, as conceivably um, we can get and we want to do so in the swiftest possible time. Because only when we do so, all over the world, that we are going to be able to return to some normality. The vaccines which arrived today have a shelf life have a shelf life up to June 27, uh, 2021 and the efficacy up to a year. With this in mind, PM Gonzalez is hoping that many Vincentians will take the vaccine. Otherwise, he said it will be a disappointment, bearing in mind the difficulty faced by small countries such as SVG to get vaccines. It will be rolled out very swiftly. Because, and, and that's why I, I get very impatient and a little... Um, dismayed would be too strong a word. I get disappointed that some people are saying that they don't want to take the vaccines. The, the difficulties to get the vaccines are real. So this is an important matter for us. I know, I know that people are saying that 
um, they they're gonna wait. They're gonna see. They're gonna well. You can't wait too long. You can't wait too long. You want to get back to normal? See, it is better we all take the vaccine as soon as we possibly can. Prime Minister Gonzalez further noted that he has already given emergency authorization for the co-vaccine made in India, another COVID-19 vaccine which is now in its third trial. The medical authorities here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as you know, they are going through their third stage trials and one expects that they will be done successfully because we have to remember that the vaccines, they have an efficacy for about a year, and then you'll have to get your quote-unquote booster. So we need to make arrangements, not only for now, for this first round of vaccines. I've been advised we need to make arrangements appropriate, continuing, because we have to live well with this virus. That's, that's just a fact of life. SVG has given emergency authorization for eight vaccines, including two that are still in trial stages. The cluster of COVID-19 cases at the Mental Health Rehabilitation Center in Glen is now at 92. The figure includes 86 patients and six members of staff. It was first reported on Friday, February 26, by the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, that 21 patients and two staff members of the center tested positive for the virus. And on Saturday, NEMO reported that 18 more patients and two members of staff were among the 23 cases recorded on that day. The other three were from tests done at flu clinics. In another update provided on Sunday evening, Nemo said the country recorded 49 new cases, all from the Mental Health Rehabilitation Center, which include 47 patients and two staff members. These positives were recorded from RT-PCR tests conducted on patients and staff on Saturday, on Saturday, February 27, 2021, as part of the ongoing contact tracing and general screening. Nemo said isolation and quarantine measures continue to be implemented, along with additional testing to ensure containment of any further spread in the facility. It said screening of admissions will also continue as a measure to reduce the risk of the introduction of new infections. Two persons were cleared, uh, bringing the number of total recoveries to 938. 682 cases remain active and eight persons with COVID-19 have died. 1,628 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since March 2020. The public is urged to use a mask, sanitize, physical distance, and get vaccinated to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in SVG. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, has announced an easing of restriction on the number of persons who can gather at churches and other places of worship. However, other indoor gatherings continue to be restricted to 10 persons and outdoor gatherings to 20 persons. According to the latest protocol, which will be in effect until March 27th, effective Saturday, February 27, 2021, places of worship are now permitted to have a maximum of one-third their regular capacity for indoor gathering. An explanation for the change was provided today by Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simone Kiza Beach at the handing over ceremony of 40,000 Covishield AstraZeneca vaccines from India at the Argyle International Airport. As it is now, if you have your FET, it's still only 10 persons inside, 20 persons outside. If you are a house of worship, you are allowed to have persons that 
would come up to one third of your regular capacity. So if I have a church that can normally hold 100 persons well spaced, I can now take 30, 33 persons, one third well spaced. So that was the major change because it was found that the churches, the majority of them, they are in the best possible um, situation to control. You have a door, you're coming in, you must sanitize, you must wear your mask, you must register so that we can track if anything happens and you control what's happening there. Meanwhile, the chief medical officer clarified at the handed over ceremony today for the vaccines why the Ministry of Health still need vaccinated travelers entering St. Vincent and the Grenadines to quarantine for seven days as is recommended by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Currently in the U.S., they have done significant amounts of immunization, so they are much further along in this journey towards community immunity. That's not the situation here, that's one. Two, as I said before, in the same question, why do we wear the mask? We are still not 100% sure that if I, if I have my vaccination, I come in, I can still be infected. I can still hand it to somebody else. And this is what we have been from day one. That's why we put in the measures at the airport. That's why we ramped up. So we need to decrease the likelihood of somebody coming in. Yes, you're vaccinated, but you can still have the virus there. Reduce risk. Over the next few weeks, we monitor that to see what sort of yield. When we went from five days in a hotel to um, seven days, it was because we realized that persons at five days who came with a negative test on arrival, when we were tested on arrival, turned up at five days with a positive test. The CMO added that it is also important for all travelers to produce a valid vaccination document upon entry to get the reduced days for quarantine. And we changed the protocol so that if you are coming in, you have had both doses of your vaccine, if it's Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and when the Johnson Johnson one rolls out, it will be one dose. You've had it four weeks since you've had that final or single dose. You come in with evidence that you have had that and not that somebody writes a scribble note and says, I had the vaccine, we need an official document. Your quarantine period, if you are coming from a high risk, which would normally be come with a negative PCR, no more than 72 hours, go into a quarantine facility for 14 days, you will come in with your negative, you would have a PCR on arrival, you will go into a facility for seven days, you would have a third test on day five, and if, that's, if they're all negative, you will go. So we have decreased the, the um, quarantine in a facility to seven days. And Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez has expressed his disappointment with the reports he said he have been receiving about omnibuses that are still not complying with the COVID-19 protocols. The Prime Minister recently announced that omnibus operators will receive a subsidy of between 500 and 600 EC dollars for the next two months on the conditions they follow the health protocols, which stipulate that they carry half their passenger capacity and everyone on board must wear a mask. However, on the Issues at Hand program on WFM last Sunday, PM Gonzalez said persons have been complaining that a number of the omnibuses continue to carry full capacity, four passengers on each seat and conductors are refusing to wear a mask. PM Gonzalez said he already spoken to the Commission of Police and the head of the Traffic Department on the matter. And they've given the assurance that steps are being taken to ensure these omnibuses comply with the protocols. In reports that a number of the minibus operators, a, a significant number of them, uh, still jamming up four people on every on every seat, and not um, and not. And conductor not wearing the mask. 
and well the commissioner told me that he was getting reports that the the traffic and the other police in the districts doing their job and so to superintendent john and i listened to them but i had to tell them that that very morning a member of the staff here at the residence who uses the bus to get home she went to little tokyo and she told me that they were four in a seat and the conductor is not wearing his mask and she asked him why you not wearing your mask the Prime Minister reiterated that omnibus operators who continue to break the COVID-19 protocols will not receive the subsidy. He also suggests that the police get more serious with the omnibuses on the road. I expect to get the $500 and still be doing that. I'm not going to throw away public, the, the, the taxpayers' money by doing it. I'm telling them that. I'm making arrangements to pay them. But 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 I can't have that happening. And the 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 police have been taken off, not so much prosecuting or, or issuing any tickets. The police have been taken off passengers now mm -hmm. when they stop when they stop them. But what the police should do too is not just take off passengers. Just when you do know, when I when I when a fellow I can't tell them how to do their work. Additional instruments have been installed at Fancy and on the Windward Trail of the Lasso Freire Volcano to aid in its continuous monitoring. This is according to lead scientist monitoring the volcano, Dr. Christopher, Dr. Thomas Christopher, speaking on radio this morning. We, um, we managed to install two more instruments, permanent GPS at um, Fancy. We also installed a, a seismometer at the, the trailhead of the Windward Trail, at the start of the Windward Trail, um, close to where the buildings are. Um, we haven't had a chance to, to get a, a dome survey in because the weather has not been the best. The team went up on Saturday, but the weather was not ideal. They couldn't see the dome. It was quite rainy. So we didn't get a chance to scan the dome. So it's been a bit disappointing in regards to the dome scans. Because Dr. Christopher, who is expected to step down from his lead position this week and focus more on the groundwork in terms of gas measurement as a gas specialist, said the monitoring team has embarked on a new venture to collect and analyze soil samples for carbon dioxide emissions found in the soil. This, he said, is being done to decipher the driving force behind the present eruption at the volcano. At present, we've started a new campaign, which is measuring soil CO2. Um, and let me just give you a bit of background about that. Um, the carbon dioxide that we measure in, in the gas plume only accounts for a portion of the carbon dioxide that the system produces. Um, quite a bit of it actually comes up through the ground. In terms of us trying to figure out what's happening with this eruption, we need to have an idea of, of where this lava is coming from, the lava that we're seeing. What we're also going to do is we're going to, is we're going to crush some of these rocks and look at the carbon dioxide in, in, in some trap, trapped um, melts in the crystal. So we, we could analyze those, that little um, uh, melt inclusion for gases. And basically what we're going to do, we're going to try and figure out how deep the degassing is happening. And we can probably quantify how much magma is degassing based on how much carbon dioxide we're seeing. So we, 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 we want to have an idea of the driving, the, what's the driving force behind this eruption. According to Dr. Christopher, while scientists are unable to predict the exact time before an explosive eruption occurs, there are telltale signs which scientists will use to gauge the speed with which an eruption is progressing. These signs determine whether they are a few hours or a few days before the imminent eruption. Dr. Christopher, however, reiterated that at present, the Lasso Freire volcano is not a threat, but this can change in an instant. Providing an update on the analysis of rock samples that was sent to England last month, Dr. Christopher said the results, while delayed, will be processed as soon as possible.
A virtual meeting will be held tomorrow uh, beginning at 6 p.m. for persons in the North Leeward area to receive updates and discuss Nemo's plan of action for residents. The evening speakers for the virtual meeting Ayan Lassofre will be Dr. Christopher, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and the head of Nemo, Michelle Forbes. In other news, Fire Chief Superintendent of Police Joel James is appealing to members of the public to stop being malicious by reporting fake fires. He told SOG TV News uh, that the fire department in Kingston has been receiving calls reporting fires in distant places and when the fire trucks get to these areas, there is no signs of a fire. SOP James said it is a waste of resources and manpower and persons should desist from engaging in such act. If you know that there isn't any fire, please do not call out the fire department because you're talking about manpower and resources which would be used for nothing. Okay? So we want that cooperation from you. There are some other persons who would call and report that there is a fire. Someone house is on fire at Cain Garden without even checking it out. When we respond to that fire at Cain Garden, it's someone who is just lighting or um, some bush in the backyard or someone roasting a breadfruit in their yard. So please check out these things before you call us. Not every smoke you see would be someone fire house is on, on fire. SOP James said the fire trucks are also faced with another challenge, that of motorists who deliberately choose to stay in the road when they hear the fire truck siren. According to the fire chief, such action has consequences in that a motorist can be charged with an offense. They will, some of them will speed up. Some of them will drive slower and they do not pull aside for the fire appliance mm -hmm. to proceed. Now, that is an offense under the Traffic Act, which says, as long as you hear the siren of the fire truck, you're supposed to pull as close as possible to the left curb of any road. So to give the fire appliance going to or from a fire scene adequate space to pass and to continue their journey to a fire scene. So you persons who do not want to recognize the presence of the fire appliance we want to let you know that you can be charged and you will be charged if you continue to do what you're doing. SOP James is also asking that persons stop parking their vehicles in the road of communities where the roads are already narrow. This, he said, can hamper the flow of traffic and prevent the quick response of a fire truck in the event of a fire. Also, there are, there are persons who would park their vehicles on narrow streets. And there are times when we would have responded to fires and had to wait 45 minutes before the fire plants can pass because persons would just park their vehicles and just go away. Some of them sometimes at nights you are asleep and there's a fire in your area. We have to wait on you until you remove your vehicle. So you, you, we have to look at all these things. Um, when we are parking our vehicles, you can park as close as possible to the left of the road so that you can leave adequate space for a truck to pass. 
and Law Compliance and Enforcement Officer with the Forestry Service Department in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, Bradford Latham, is appealing to persons not to hunt wildlife animals and birds at this time, which is the closed season, noting that if caught, you can be charged. The season for bird hunting came to an end yesterday, Sunday, February 28, while the season for other wildlife animals closed at the end of January. So for the, the year, we had generally a very good season, more or less incident-free. We didn't record any infraction of persons um, entering reserve areas and protected areas to um, do any hunting. Um, we like to appeal to the public that um, and remind them that now this season is closed. No one should be engaged in hunting any of these wildlife species. Mm. If you are met with any gun and gun in, in forestry, mean air rifle, blow pipe, slingshot, anything that can discharge a missile at any of these wildlife, you'll be deemed hunting and you can be arrested. If you comply, the way the law is written, you, you, you comply, um, you may get a chance. But we like to educate first, and if you do not um, comply, we do enforce. Latham said that the dry season is very hard on the wildlife animals, and they will be seen along the roadside and other places in the public to get water. Hence, he is urging everyone to play a part in protecting them at this time. Now we are going into the dry season. A lot of these wildlife, um, some especially the iguana, they will be pregnant. They'll be in, on, out in search of water and um, areas to lay their eggs, dry areas. Please resist from interfering with these species, allow them to get the, the water, whether it's from a drain or some water in hole off. It might be weird within your, your premises. Allow them to able to get that water or move to an area that is suitable for them to, to lay eggs. The dry season do have a hard time on, on, on many wildlife species. So um, we as citizens, as also persons who caretakers, I always say that it's not only forestry department, the justice caretaker. We need all the agencies, all citizens to be part, play their role in protecting and conserving these wildlife species. The forestry officer also noted that bushfire during this time caused harm not only to wildlife animals, but also to the forest, the forest and entire ecosystem. Hence, he is also appealing to persons to desist from lighting bushfires at this time. You may see lands that are idle, dry grass. Please do not light these areas with, with uh, ignited with fire. It damages the whole ecosystem. It um, interferes with the wildlife. Um, it kills a lot of the, the, the species that are there, especially the wildlife species that are unable to escape. So we encourage best practices um, regarding clearing. So if you brush down the area before, it encourages some flushing of the, the, the wildlife. You give them a chance to, to escape. So you flush first and you do a control burn. So you do heaps. Hence, you do not have the fires going out of control. The police are investigating two reports of burglary, one in the Queen's Drive area and the other at Rottermill. According to the police, a 29-year-old sales clerk of Queen's Drive made a report of burglary against some unknown person or persons. The unknown assailant or assailants reportedly entered the dwelling house of the virtual complainant and stole a quantity of items, including a Samsung Galaxy tablet, two bottles of perfume, and an assortment of jewelry totaling over 7,000 EC dollars. The properties of the 29-year-old sales clerk and a 29-year-old technician of Kane Garden. 
In reference to the burglary at Rotter Mill, uh, this report was made by a 62-year-old resident of Fair Hall against some unknown person or persons. The police say the unknown assailant or assailants stole one grey rubber dinghy valued at 1500 EC dollars. The property of the 62-year-old resident of Fair Hall. The incident occurred at Rotter Mill between February February 23rd and February 27th, 2021. Persons with information that can assist with these investigations are asked to contact the Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Crimes at telephone number 1784-456139 or the Officer in Charge of the South Central Division at 1784-458400 or any police station or police officer you are comfortable with. All information the police say will be treated confidentially. And that brings us to the end of our local news. We hear that Jamaica Tourism Minister uh, says vaccine delays are disrupting Caribbean economies, which badly bleeding, which are badly bleeding and need to be thrown a lifeline. And this from the region, when we return, still.